Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Maris Kreisman and I run events and marketing at McNally Jackson. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event for the store. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming days and weeks. Please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's readings and conversations for your questions. You can use the Zoom chat function to submit any questions you have and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room together right now, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've changed phases from staying at home to opening for curbside pickup to again admitting customers into our four locations, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. I will post links in the chat tonight to buy The Best of Brevity, as well as books by some of the writers featured tonight. And so we get to the main event. How much of the human experience can fit into 750 words? A lot, it turns out. Since its founding in 1997, Brevity has published hundreds of brief nonfiction essays, each within that strict word count. Over the past 20 years, Brevity has become one of the longest running and most popular online literary publications. The Best of Brevity brings you 84 of the best love reader favorites collected in print for the first time. And I'm so glad there are a bunch of contributors here with us tonight. I am so delighted to welcome the editors of Brevity. Uh, Zoe Bossier is co-editor of The Best of Brevity, 20 groundbreaking years of flash nonfiction. And she's a doctoral candidate at Ohio University with a dual concentration in creative writing and rhetoric and composition. She's managing editor of Brevity, a journal of concise literary nonfiction and a podcast host for the New Books Network's literary, literature channel where she interviews authors about their debut books of nonfiction. Her writing has been published in Guernica, The Rumpus, the North Dakota Quarterly and Essay Daily among other places. And Dinty W. Moore is the co-editor of The Best of Brevity, 20 Groundbreaking Years of Flash Nonfiction. And he's the author of the memoir Between Panic and Desire, winner of the Grub Street Nonfiction Book Prize, and is editor of the Rose Metal Press Field Guide to Writing Flash Nonfiction, among other books. Moore has also published essays and stories in the Southern Review, the Georgia Review, Harper's, the New York Times Magazine, Arts and Letters, and the Normal School. He edits Brevity, a journal of concise literary nonfiction, and he is deathly afraid of polar bears. So glad you're it's here. true, Maris. That's <laughs> absolutely true. Um, I want to thank McNally Jackson, most of all, and underline what Maris said, that please support McNally Jackson. Please support, support small businesses anywhere you can. But if you're buying books, uh, McNally Jackson needs your help right now. Um, when I began Brevity, I'm Dinty. Uh, I began Brevity in 1997, and I really expected it to last about a year or two. It was much more of an experiment than it was a commitment. But to my surprise, Brevity limped along, and, and soon enough, uh, writers were sending their work, hoping that we would publish it. And then all of a sudden, we were getting a lot of work from some amazingly talented writers like Roxane Gay, Brian Doyle, Gia Tolentinto, and the three amazing authors you're going to hear from this evening. I'm very excited about the anthology we're reading from and discussing tonight. Uh, we celebrated our 20th anniversary, as Maris mentioned, and my co-editor, Zoe Bossier, suggested it might be time to put together a collection. I was uh, reluctant at first. It seemed like a lot of work, and I'm very glad that I listened to her. Uh, we released, we did the book. We released it, obviously, uh, about two weeks back. It was reviewed rather spectacularly in the New York Times recently, and here we are. It has been a very exciting ride. Each issue for me is a new lesson on what can be done in 750 words or fewer, and you'll hear some examples soon. Uh, I'm bullish on the future of flash nonfiction as a genre for a few reasons. As you may have noticed, the world is very complicated right now, and flash offers the opportunity to offer a greater diversity of voices and viewpoints. Uh, it also allows us as readers to visit many other worlds, many other realities, many other perspectives. And I think all of that is good and something that we need right now. Uh, 
I'm also pretty bullish on Flash because of the writers uh, who are sending work to the magazine still. They seem to reinvent the genre and extend what is possible from year to year to year. Soon enough, you'll see this for yourself. Um, my job is to introduce uh, the writers. We're gonna hear from three of them. We're gonna talk with them a little bit. And, and as Maris said, there will certainly be time for your questions. So throw them up in the chat window as they occur to you. Uh, we have three readers. And the first one is Rajpreet Hare. Rajpreet received her MFA in creative nonfiction from George Mason University. She has published nonfiction in both commercial and literary venues, including The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Teen Vogue, and many others. She is now an assistant professor of creative nonfiction at Ithaca College. Rajpreet, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dinti. Uh, the piece I'll be reading to all of you today is an Indian in yoga class, Finding Imbalance. Can everyone hear me? Good, okay. Uh, Sukhanasana, my intent for the day's practice, become more Indian. As an Indian from Indiana who has never been to India, I want to get in touch with my roots and doing yoga seems like a fun way to do that. As we flutter our eyelids open, Brittany, the instructor says, today we're going to focus on our third chakra where Ganesh lives and Buddha sometimes visits. Unleash your Kali. I'm Sikh and don't know my Hindu gods that well, except for a couple lessons from history classes, but I'm not sure that Buddha is supposed to be included with them. But what do I know? Brittany is the authority on this stuff. Also, she has Sanskrit tattoos and I don't. Vinyasa, as everyone raises their prayer hands to the ceiling for a sun salutation and time to major laser, Kyle from the front desk sneaks in to photograph the class for the studio's Instagram page, just like the Indians did thousands of years ago. Hashtag you are enough. Hashtag be here now. Hashtag strength goals. Hashtag yoga every goddamn day. Hashtag namaste. Hashtag mad relax. Hashtag good vibes. Hashtag namaste AF. <laughs> Tadasana, pick a dristi. I know, such an exotic word, says Brittany. Would the name Christy be exotic in India or Misty, Rice Krispie? We only have distant relatives left in India, but I suppose I could ask my British relatives who go to India more frequently than my American side. Bakasana, I'm so happy I got a spot in this class. The woman next to me says, as we wait for Brittany to get his blocks. Brittany discovered yoga in 2009 and she brought it to America. She knows everyone in India by name and the color of their aura. And she was asked to star in Slumdog Millionaire but turned it down because the title made it seem like a movie on consumerism. I think about the $300 I paid for a 10 class card Maybe the classes are expensive because the studio has exceptional instructors. Artemiyadrasana. As I twist toward the wall, I see a poster for a sari draping class taking place in the studio th that week. I could ask my mom to teach me the next time I'm home, but Brittany probably knows more. Brittany has henna on her hands and nose piercing, neither of which my mom has. Virbhadranasana, stand strong in this pose, one hand reaching into the future towards juice generation and another reaching back towards the past to Starbucks. Stay in the present and think about how good you look in your Lululemons, Brittany instructs. Concentration is key here or karma will not lead us to Nirvana. An interruption, Kyle opens the door and walks down the center of the room. He announces, yoga, it's a way of life, then throws clouds of turmeric into the air. People around me raise their hands to it in devotion, swaying side to side on their sit bones, while other yogis start snorting it off the hardwood floor. Hashtag bliss. Sadhu Badu Sarvagasana. Rameshwarya, move your hands closer to the back of your heels. My name is actually Rajpreet, I reply. 
It's Rameshwarya since I knew a Rameshwarya once, but my name is Rajpreet. No. Shavasana. Brittany explains this is the hardest pose, and it really does feel like it. I don't feel relaxed. In fact, I feel more stressed than when I arrived. A white woman is teaching me about yoga, an ancient Indian practice, and she thinks she's an expert on Indian culture too. But I don't know exactly which ways I can be mad because I don't know enough about India or yoga myself, partly because I feel pressure to assimilate. But darn it, Brittany's playlist isn't fun. Namaste. The cultural appropriation in me bows to the Indian in you. Putting away mats. What other instructors would you recommend? I asked Brittany. Katie, Jenny, Julie, Courtney, Zoe, Christy, Mary, Lucy, Haley, Ashley, Natalie, Lindsay, Kaylee, Lizzie, and Audrey are a maze. Exit. I follow the trail of organic quinoa down the hall to the door and leave feeling very Indian American. Ah, I had to unmute. I was going to throw uh, clouds of turmeric in the air to celebrate that piece, but I was worried what it would do to my keyboard and, and uh, my computer. I remember when that piece first showed up in the queue uh, in submittable as, as, you know, as a submission of the magazine, uh, I felt very uncomfortable because I'm a, a, a big old white guy who takes yoga. And uh, even though it's funny, it, it, it kind of pushed me in, in some very awkward ways. And I, and I like that. Um, you know, that's what literature does. That's what, that's what we do as writers and artists is make people think and rethink and, and look at what they think. So um, to be that funny and also to, drop some truth out there. Uh, I, I applaud you for that. It's a very strong piece. It is. And I also love the irony in it because I think, you know, at Brevity, we, we publish all kinds of essays, but it's rare that, that there's one that hinges so specifically on irony and is so funny, like genuinely just very funny. And I love to assign it in classes because I think it's a great example of how to tell an impactful story in a humorous way in order to make a, a pretty, um, I would say, poignant point about appropriation. An Indian from Indiana is an amazing line. Yes, it is. And you are from Indiana, which is, you know, yeah. so funny. Yeah, we moved there partly because India is in the name, specifically Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> I mean, it means land of the Indians, like, you know, so it's really where I belong. Yeah, the, the whole history of the word Indian in North America is a total mess. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Tori Peters now. Tori is the author of the novel Detransition Baby, which will be published by One World in January of 2021, which I realize now is next month. Congratulations. Thank you. Detransition Baby. Um, she's also author of the novellas Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones and The Masker. She holds an MFA from the University of Iowa and a master's in comparative literature from Dartmouth. Tori rides a pink motorcycle and splits her time between Brooklyn, where she is now, and an off-grid cabin in Vermont. Um, Tori's piece is one of the, it is in fact the, well, we've published two pieces in the history of brevity that were more than 750 words. The first one was a mistake I never noticed. Uh, the second one, Tori's piece, which she's about to read, uh, we decided to let it go long because of the importance of what she's writing about. And uh, I think you'll see that for yourself. Thank you, Tori. Thank you. Um, I'll just let people know this piece is kind of brutal. So trigger warning for transphobic violence. And part of the point of it is that it feels a little bit endless, but just so you know, it's gonna be about seven minutes so that you can, you know, uh, if you have to leave and come back about seven minutes. Um, all right. So. These are not my words. These are, this is taken from uh, an NGO 
uh, and it's the remarks section of a, an NGO that monitors violence against trans women, and it's the trans murder monitoring results. Brunette was beaten to death with a stick. The victim was shot by two men on a motorcycle in front of a motel. The victim was shot in the head. The suspected murderer is a former military policeman. A neighbor heard the victim scream at night and saw two men walking out of the victim's room but could not remember their faces. The case is under investigation. The victim was found tied to a chair with multiple stab wounds in her abdomen. Police reported that the trans person was well known and admired and murdered by her lover with seven stabs. A 14 year old trans person was found strangled. The victim was stabbed eight times. The victim was shot by a man on a motorbike. The victim was shot by two men on by two times by two men on a motorbike. The victim was found in a lake. She was a Romani person. The victim was the body of the victim was found handcuffed. The body of the victim was found dismembered. The body of the victim was found handcuffed. The victim was a person of color. The undignified way her, her burned body was dumped in a trash indicates transgender hostility. Ro Rosa was a person of color and of Indonesian descent. Police is investigating a possible hate crime. Police is investigating the crime as a possible homophobic hate crime. Alondra was a person of color. Police suspect that more than one person was involved in what they would describe as a barbaric murder. The victim was slaughtered, beaten, and stoned. The corpse was found half naked in a wasteland. The, victim, the face of the victim was smashed by a client with a stone after having sexual intercourse. The victim's body was, was found with tied hands and a plastic on the road. Investigations revealed that several cars had run over the corpse. No Lopez was attacked in a sex worker's place, forced into a vehicle by a group of armed men wearing bulletproof vests and balaclavas. Amnesty International sees this murder in connection with a series of murders of sex workers in San Pedro Sula. The note in the newspaper reports that the homicide is the product of insecurity and violence lived in the city. Sanchez was on her way to a party dressed in a skirt when she was attacked by two men who stabbed her to death. Belizean LGBT NGO Unibam called the murder a hate crime. Sanchez has been harassed and received death threats before in the days leading to her murder. The victim was killed with an axe after having a dispute with a young man in a bar. Witnesses report that the victim was verbally assaulted and later shot. The victim was set on fire by four persons and died from burn injuries in the hospital. Bouchesha was a person of color. The body of the victim showed signs of torture. The police believe that the murder took place because the victim was a trans person. Strangers tossed shot towards the victim's house, causing her death. According to the newspaper report, the victim was tortured and beaten to death by a lawmaker and four of his assistants accusing the victim of a theft of a mobile phone. The murder is described as a barbaric crime. The, the victim was dismembered and her face totally destroyed with a knife. The victim was killed by a 14-year-old minor. The police is investigating the crime as a possible hate crime, as this is the second stabbing of a trans person within one month and under similar circumstances. The victim was beaten to death by a group of people in found hang. The victim was a person of color. Raisa was shot six times on the head and thorax. The victim was using a public phone when she was shot to death with 10 shots by two men on a motorbike. Denise was tortured with the peak of a bottle. The victim was stabbed 11 times. She was attacked by a, by a man in a group of five men. The murder claimed that the victim criticized on his unimpressive sex they just had. He was angry and then beat her with a hardwood and stole her valuables. The victim was found wrapped in a black plastic bag. The NGO Red Umbrella reports that Sabja's murder was her boyfriend, who fled to Serbia when he, where he called the police and confessed the murder. Police report that the murder was the result of fights between trans people. Alex, an eight-year-old child, moved to six months ago to Rio de Janeiro to live with the father. The father had beaten the child to death to, quote, teach him to behave like a man, as the child did belly dancing, wore female clothing, and loved dishwashing. Camilla was executed with 15 shots. CCTV footage shows how a trans sex worker is approached by a man sitting in a car and then shot from inside of the car. The victim was stabbed to death and her personal belongings were stolen, such as her laptop computer. The murder is still unknown and the case is under investigation. The victim's body shows signs of torture. Andressa was attacked by several persons in a cemetery and stabbed 15 times. Rosa Marie was stabbed 12 times. The murder happened several weeks after the implement implementation of the so-called anti-gay bill in Uganda. Queen, a trans sex worker, had been attacked by a guy whom her friends believed she met at a bar. During the attack, she called her friends by phone saying, the guy is beating me, the guy is killing me. She was found later by her friends with severe wounds and signs of torture, cut from, cuts from a bottle on her body and in her anus. Queen was hospitalized and died several days later. Coco was a well-known drag queen. The victim's body was thrown to the street. Allegedly, the police saw the event and did not intervene. Vanessa received death threats before she was murdered. Paulette was executed with 15 shots when she approached a client in a car at night. The murder was reported as a homophobic cave murder. Danny was beaten in the face before she was shot to death. Parts of the body of the victim have been found in different garbage bags at a cemetery. The skin of the torso was torn off. The suspect is a special force police officer who wanted to pay less for a service and killed Jade Esmeralda inside his car when she didn't agree. Giovanni was a person of color. The victim was found, found stabbed to death in our condominium unit. The victim was beaten to death by a group of people 
in the middle of the street at night. The victim was hit in the head. Giovanni was stabbed 11 times. The victim presented stabs all around the body. She was murdered by two clients in her own apartment due to an argument over the price of, for the sexual service. The victim, the victim's body showed signs of physical violence and was hit, was hit on the head. The victim's body showed multiple wounds on its body. The victim was stoned. Nicole was shot five times in the head. The victim was stoned, found stabbed four times and her body was burned. The victim was a person of color. The arrested suspect offended Jennifer and two other trans women who were sex workers. Later, he returned with another man in a car and stabbed Jennifer to death. The victim was a person of color. She was shot by two men. The victim was found tied up and showed signs of torture with her face burnt on purpose. Marcia was executed with a shot to the head. The victim's body was found in a pit and showed signs of torture, plus a shot to the head. Other bodies were found in the pit. The victim was a person of color. The victim was found tied with, with multiple stab wounds and with her genitals exposed. The victim was a person of color. Shariah was found beaten to death with a stick on a hill in Rio de Janeiro in the morning. A news magazine reported that she provided sexual services to a policeman the night before. The victim was a person of color. She was found burned behind a garbage bin. The victim was a person of color. The victim was raped before she was beaten to death with a stick. The victim's body was beaten multiple times in the face. The, the suspected murder strangled Kellen and threw her body into the swimming pool of the hotel. McKelly was found naked with signs of hanging. Police are searching for a man who is chasing and killing trans persons. Two men in a car approached Denise and shot four times at her. Daphine was walking in the street with another trans person when two men on a motorbike approached them and shot Daphine to death. They also tried to shoot the other trans person but failed. The victim was having a drink in a bar when two men on motorcycles passed by and shot her in the head. The victim was suffocated with a plastic bag. The victim's body was found with both hands and feet tied up. The victim was stabbed 15 times. The victim's body was found in female underwear and as a newspaper reports, quote, without eyes. Two other women in Detroit were shot within days of the murder inside Palmer Park. Giovanni was stabbed six times. The victim was found inside of her own apartment. The suspected murderer had an argument with Alexandra on the street and shot her in the back only steps away from her home. Karen was seriously injured and thrown out of a moving car by a client. Chris was shot four times by a man passing by in a car. The, victim, the police affirmed that the victim was raped before being killed. The victim was walking with another person and was stoned, causing her to die. The victim's body was found in her apartment. Her body presented 18 stab wounds. Maha Devi was impaired and pushed out of a moving train by two adolescents. It seems to be that the aggressors harassed the victim who tried to hide, but they killed her with a shotgun. Billy was standing with two other trans people near a bus stand when a man named Raja started misbehaving with Billy and got annoyed and stabbed her and injured her. Billy died in the hospital. The body of the victim was found floating in a creek. Bruno was shot by a man on a motorbike when talking with a client in front of a motel. A local LGBT NGO speculates that the motive could have been, quote, trans misogyny. Thanks. Thank you, Tori. Um, Thanks, you know, there's no, there's no uh, denying that's difficult to hear, but I, I keep thinking, the phrase, you know, isolated incident goes through my head when I listen to that. People say, oh, it's an isolated incident and the, the accumulation of, 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 of these horrible details kind of forces us to realize it's not, it's not in any way. Um, it's, it's the power of words. And that's a very powerful piece. Um, I don't know, you know, I'd say thank you, except I don't know if it's, you know, it's not mine and it's, it feels very, I feel very conflicted about it because in a lot of ways, you know, these people, they've been just reduced to a, a wound that's been inflicted on them. And then I repeat the wound rather than who they were. Um, but I also think the fact that this is all we have and there's no comment is that that discomfort is also part of it. Um, and, you know, something wouldn't be right if I didn't feel a bit conflicted about, about this essay and how it came to be and the way it circulates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because it's been reprinted quite a lot. It's um, one that I think oh, it's struck a lot of a chord with a lot of people. And it's one that I almost always teach in classes just because um, I think it's, it's not only really wonderfully put together. I mean, the way that Dinti said how um, by juxtaposing all of these instances, patterns begin to emerge. Um, but also just because I feel like students aren't necessarily exposed to this kind of attention, you know, on this particular issue, the violence against trans women and specifically trans women of color. 
And um, it's a difficult piece. I've never heard it read aloud before tonight either. I think that it, it's, it's so much more affecting hearing it in your voice. And it must have been so much more difficult to read it than it was to listen to it. So thank you for that. Um, but it's, it's just profound in a way that I think is really rare. And I'm really, really grateful that you wrote it. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, it's for me, I think not only that it, I think it does that stuff, but I also, I mean, I hope also there, that it, I, there's, there's aspects of it, you know, the fact that it gets reprinted and I know that a lot of this could go for, for questions afterwards. It's interesting to me that it's, it's the most reprinted um, essay because it's, in some ways, I think it's a little bit, one of the things that it brings up is whether or not it is an eth ethically suspect project, you know, like I, that's one of the reasons why I think it'd be interesting to teach um, because I think it's in a sort of vein of, of work that, um, that, that is potentially ethically suspect, but it's also politically potent, you know, and we see a lot of like, you know, ways in which people say people's names or they talk about, we know the names Brianna Taylor, we know Tamir Rice, we know these names, but we know them because of victimhood and because of wounds that were inflicted on them that, that aren't who they are. Um, and so that sort of tension between what is, you know, it, that's always there for me, especially as I'm reading it aloud, I have a strange kind of a sense of, I have a guilt, you know, when I read it, I, I, like, who am I to say this? Um, which this is the first time reading it aloud and, I'm, and, and that sort of feeling comes, comes across in this, in this genre, but uh, um, anyway, I, won't, I, won't, I know there's it's, more rest, more rest it's, it's odd, of course, that you're reading it aloud for the first time alone in your room. Instead of, you know, instead of with, a, with all of us sitting out there able to interact in, in a more human way than this Zoom allows. Thank you very much for that reading. Thank you for having me. Our third reader is Kristen Radke. She is the author of the graphic nonfiction book, Imagine Wanting Only This, and the forthcoming Seek You, Essays on American Loneliness, which will be out uh, the middle of next year. And I'm excited about that. Uh, she received a 2019 Whiting, Whiting Creative Nonfiction grant for that book. Um, and she's also the author of Terrible Men, a graphic novel uh, from Pantheon. She's the art director and de deputy publisher of The Believer magazine. Her work has appeared in The New York Times, Mary Claire, The Atlantic, The Guardian, GQ, Vogue, Oxford American, and many, many other wonderful places. Uh, Kristen's going to present graphic uh, nonfiction for us tonight, and I'm excited about that. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Denti. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a an honor to gather with um, writers I admire so much. And I do just wanna say um, some gratitude too for Brevity and for magazines like uh, that, that make space for nonfiction in this way. I think there are not that many uh, anymore um, and they're getting squeezed more and more and more. Um, and I'm just grateful um, for the work y'all have done for so long. <laughs> Send us some more. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, this is um, going to be brief and um, I will share it now. Can you all see a, a, a white square? Yeah, okay. When my mother was in the bathroom for more than a few minutes, I knew that she was dead. The water made the sound it does when the sink is plugged, splashing against more water instead of the basin bottom. Her head was in it and she had drowned herself. She died this way a few times a week as I sat in the living room pretending to do homework. Mom, are you okay? Come out of the bathroom. In a minute. Can't I get a minute to myself? Thanks. That's such an amazing piece. Um, the, the, the turn, my mom died this way a couple of times a week. I think I just misquoted it, but you know what I mean? It, uh, it took me back to childhood. Um, it took me back to the, those, those feelings that, that we have on those painful feelings. Um, it's also beautifully drawn, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's what drew me to it too, is just I, 
I think that many of us who become writers were once very anxious children. <laughs> and, um, we probably still are anxious children. Yes, in many ways. And um, I remember having very similar feelings, you know, when a parent was out of sight or, um, you know, there's just so much you don't know about the world when you're younger. And I think that the, the piece captures it beautifully, um, literally beautifully, because it's a visual piece. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's all about point of view. I, I'm, you know, I'm the, the, that age, that that understanding of the world. Um, I'm going to uh, ask people to throw their questions up in the chat, um, if they would. And I'm also uh, curious if Zoe has some questions for the for the group. Yeah, I definitely do. So while people are writing questions, one thing that um, I think uh, wasn't really mentioned in between each of the pieces that were read is a little bit about the story of how you came to write that particular piece. So um, did your essay begin as something much longer or did you sort of approach it intending to write something that was short and distilled like a flash piece? Um, I can start. Um, yeah. So with my yoga piece, uh, there's like an inciting incident. So I went to yoga with my mom as in New York City at the time. She was visiting from Indianapolis. And um, like a couple classes later, the instructor was like, oh, um, you know, so-and-so is from Dubai. He has, he just had an international flight like your mom did. And I was like, what do you mean? They're like, you know, because she flew back to India. And I was like, no, Indiana. And they're like, no, they, she didn't. I was like, yeah, she did. Uh, it's a two hour domestic flight. And I found myself getting like uncomfortable because the whole class was watching. And then I started feeling bad for the instructor because I thought, oh, am I embarrassing her? And then for the rest of the class, I couldn't relax. And it was a yoga class that I paid for. And so that really kind of just stuck with me each time I go to that same studio. So I started to like literally meditate on it in class until like the piece kind of like wrote itself. At first I was gonna write as some sort of like op-ed about how yoga class makes me feel. But instead I decided because I just like hadn't done much experimental writing, I decided to see if I could use the actual poses to like get to the idea I was getting at. And so it was like a lot of weird like meditation going into it. So like literally doing the poses to get ideas. Yeah, and the, the humorous aspect of it too, were these sort of things that were running through your head at the time when um, when you were in the, the yoga classes, just these sort of uncomfortable exchanges that you witnessed? Um, yeah, I kind of like broadened it. So I thought about like just yoga culture in general and about like who like it just it just kind of like came out of nowhere and it was like super Indian. I just thought about other classes that I've been in where they someone was like, this pose is very, like it's an exotic name. And I thought, but it's probably not exotic to, you know, like the billion Indians out there that like, you know, like what does exotic mean? Um, so I just kind of like did weird research too. So I went to a lot of yoga studio Instagram pages to see what hashtags they used to see what kind of like ridiculous like pseudo Indian culture stuff that they would bring in. But then I also had to recognize, and this is where the piece kind of unlocked itself, that I don't know much about India because I've never been. My parents are from England and I have dual British American citizenship. So I don't know, it's just like, I didn't want to put that in there because I was a little bit ashamed of that, that I'm not Indian enough. But once I kind of was able to put that fact in there when I do the Shavasana pose, then I felt like the piece was complete. Yeah. Well, that's a great piece. Thank you for writing it. Um, I also want to ask, so Tori, I think I recall, so, so your piece was um, published in one of Brevity's special issues and it was uh, Experiences of Gender. And so I'm wondering how did yours begin? It was a Facebook post. It was like, uh, I just, I wrote it one night after Trans Day, Trans Day Remembrance is like this um, holiday. And I went to, it's a holiday, it's not a holiday. It's, a, you know, uh, a gathering, a day 
Uh, and anyway, uh, I went to a church where, where people read the names of uh, trans women in this country who were murdered um, in 2014. It was in 2014 that I went. And, um, and I was, that was like pretty early after I transitioned and I was, I was really upset by it and like, and I think in a very confused way, you know, because, because it was like, I went to this church and who was reading and who was responding to it. And like the people who were at the church weren't the people, weren't the trans women who were really at risk of murder and things like that. And uh, I went home that night and I just did some research and found this, uh, a, a spreadsheet basically of, that was, you know, when you Googled it, it was an internal spreadsheet of, of an NGO. And there were, there were many more murders than are there that happened in 2014 worldwide, but, and most of them were blank in terms of the notes about what it was just the person who was killed. And then, but in some of them, they had notes about what had happened to each, if, if people knew what had happened to that person. So I just took all of those notes and I made a huge block of text on Facebook and I just posted it kind of as a, a little bit of an act of aggression, I would say. Like I was upset and I like wanted other people to like feel this upsetness that I had. That I had. And um, one of the people who, who happened to see it, who I think is, you know, it got retweeted, not retweeted, reposted on Facebook. And one of the people who happened to see a repost was the, was the editor of that special issue. And so it was never an intended to be an essay. It was just an expression one night of a kind of like frenzied frustration um, that then became what it, you know, became a thing where I, five, six years later, here I am, you know, and, and I had not, and I've had to sort of like reckon with it and reckon with what it, what I, what it had done that I'd created this thing that circulated, um, you know, now. Yeah, it got quite a response on Facebook. And then of course, when it was, I think Silas Hansen's the one who, yeah, so was that, you, right? Was, yeah. That. that was, that was Silas. And thank you, Silas. For yeah, he's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, it's been reprinted several times and it's uh, in a lot of classrooms and, so I imagine you probably couldn't have thought that that would have such elicit such a reaction from people. No, and and you know I think it's like at this time I was writing about trans stuff, you know, and I was with people who wrote about trans stuff, and um, and I think it's you know I'm grateful. I'm very grateful that people are interested in this. I also think it's. And one of the reasons I'm ambivalent about it is it's indicative of a certain way that that interest gets garnered, that like interest gets garnered around trauma. And at the time I was like, we're editing at a press with a lot of like trans women who were trying to write about joy, who were trying to write about that stuff. And and one of my ambivalence things is that this is this is the way that this is what kind of took off and not things that are were about joy. And um uh, and now, now I actually think that that's, it. so was, that's kind of like, again, I've had a couple of years to think about this and now I kind of like understand and I see that, you know, it's, it's this, these, there's a place for both and, and that I am actually, I think for people to want to see the joy, they have to like sort of be like, that was a lot. And then they, then once they're like, that was a lot, well, who are these people? Like, we don't, I, you know, it's so extreme, the distillation of this violence. So like, we actually wanna know who these people are. And my hope is that that's when they start looking for the actual experiences of trans, of, you know, trans women. So I'm, I'm grateful uh, that, it, that it can circulate in that way, even though I have, you know, it's been a strange journey. Right, yeah. And hopefully they can pick up some of your books too. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, it's like, I like to think that this is like, also why it's hard for me to read is that like my whole, Thing is like I try and actually be like funny and entertaining when I read and like I'm just like wow I'm really I'm killing the room here <laughs> Not to, uh, but yeah so um but yeah thank you I'm so glad that you're here tonight thank you um so Kristen 
you uh, have written a lot of different essays in this graphic form. Um, I have imagined wanting only this on my bookshelf. Uh, can you talk about sort of your journey into graphic nonfiction in general, um, this piece in particular? Yeah, as uh, I've, I'm listening to these like beautiful eloquent stories about how how the essays came to be, and I I'm trying to remember, and it, you know, it was a it was at least 10 years ago at this point, I think it was, this was published maybe in like 2012 or something, but I, you know, I think I actually had, I think it was for like a woman's issue or women's issue or something uh, of brevity. Um, and, and I'm trying to remember if I, if, if I wrote it specifically to be a single page, I think I did. I know at some point it was in my first book, like a very, very early version of my first book before I really knew what that was. Like, I think it was part of my grad school thesis actually at Iowa, at the University of Iowa, but I can't, um, it's hard for me to remember even like how this piece started, which is so strange. Um, but, but yeah, and during like towards the end of grad, I mean, I, I was always writing, I was always drawing and it wasn't really until the end of grad school that I, I think it was the last semester and I was like, why don't I just try a comic? I'll just, I'll just do that. And then that ended up becoming the beginning of my first book, but I didn't know that for a few years when I did that, it took, um, some time for me to come around to, uh, the process of writing a book because it's very arduous and, um, I also just didn't know how to draw comics. So I, I, I really had to teach myself how to do that when I did my first book and I redrew it a couple of times. Um, but it was kind of just like a slow coming around to that form, I think. How is it different to write uh, with illustrations in mind than it would be to write a standard text essay? I think it's just like a different way of organizing ideas. You know, like there's not, you know, like I used to think in paragraphs and now I think in panels, I think it's probably like the simplest way to think about it it's just like uh it's just an, it's just a different way of organizing ideas um but I think that every graphic writer just has to kind of make a set of rules for themselves about what's drawn and what's written and then in how it and how those two things work together and that's something that can change from project to project or even like scene to scene or page to page or idea to idea but um I think generally when I start I um I have I try to have some idea about how the two could interact um, cause that's to me, what's most exciting. It's not necessarily about like illustrating a script, um, as much as it is like those two things being in conversation from the beginning, or at least I, I, I hope that they are from the beginning. I remember being a very young writer and looking and thinking, boy, I think I'll write a book. That can't be too hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I remember being a much older and wiser writer thinking maybe I'll do a graphic memoir. And I wrote, you know, I drew about three panels and I went, boy, this is hard. It this is, so it is time. hard, but it's also, it's, it's the time, I mean, it's, it's time. It's just, and it's just also, it's like learning a new language. I mean, it just takes, it just takes time, but it's, it's also like, you know, the thing I always tell people who say they can't draw, like there's, I can name 10 beautiful graphic novels by people who don't have technical drawing skills. Like there's so many ways to tell a story visually. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, and I also think there is like, it is, I think that generally making a graphic novel takes longer than, than making a prose book, but it's not that it's more difficult. Like, in fact, there are some advantages to graphic books that, you know, like I'll think about like if I, in the before times when we could go to residencies, you know, I would be, I would be the one who was working for like 12 hours a day and the writers would be like, how can you, you know, how can you be doing this for 12 hours a day? And like, it's very easy to feel superior in those moments as if I'm like, you know, the one who's very dedicated to my craft, but that's not true. I mean, it's just that like, I'm accessing a different part of my brain that isn't so like, I can be exhausted at the end of a work day and I can still draw, but I can't write anymore. It's just like a different, it's just like a different uh, part of the brain. So there is like, there is also, it feels a little bit like cheating sometimes because I can, you know, like have Law and Order SVU or something I'm playing in the background or something and I'm still working. So I, I have a book coming out in March and I have four panels that I've illustrated for the beginning of each chapter. Cool. Like baby steps. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it starts. It was fun. Yeah, and your next book will be a graphic memoir, right, Dinty? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, your yours is yours is Dinty. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Wanna, I don't think I can. There was a lot of it was fun, but boy, it is time consuming. Yeah. Yeah, but yours is not going to be. Mine is no. I'm. I hope to never write another memoir ever again. Um, the next <laughs> okay. one is. Um, I'm a, a very small part in it, but it's just a sort of a cultural study about loneliness in America. 
Oh, okay. it's great. It is illustrated. It is illustrated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, all right. So I have another question for all three of you. And that is um, what, what sort of tips do you have about writing flash, maybe particularly for those who are interested in starting to write that way, or those who are interested in teaching flash in their classrooms? What was most helpful to you? Maybe that would be a good place to start. I mean, personally, like, you know, I'm like the probably not the person who should go first, given that I'm the one who didn't meet the 750 word limit. But <laughs> um, I'll just say that, like, for me, the the just what 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 gives me ideas is actually reading like a collection like this where there's just like all of these varied approaches. And so if I have like a story and like, I don't know exactly, I didn't want to get this emotion across that, that here's like 85 different possibilities that I can try it. And I'll oftentimes like, I'll have my idea and then I can just sort of like, kind of be like, well, would it work as a list? Would it work as like a paragraph? Would it work as, would it work in like sort of vignettes that I could like, you know, all of these different things. And usually one of them, like the answer sort of arises and the more sort of tools that I have that I've been exposed to and seen other writers do it, the more I can kind of crib from that. Um, so that's actually like why I started reading Brevity way back when was I was like, how do you, how do you actually do this kind of concision, you know? Yeah, by example, I, I feel like as an editor, um, cause I'm a writer and an editor, I feel very lucky because I get to read so many flash essays all the time, even ones that you know don't get selected to be published. And you're right that it it has a profound impact on the way that I see sentences, mm -hmm. you know, and how they get to, you know from the beginning to the end, and you know what is a more concise way to say that, you know, do I really need these words? So th that's a great tip. Um, yeah. So Rajpreet and Kristen, what do you think? Have you taught in your class? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I'm teaching creative nonfiction next semester. I mean, this is helpful to think now about. Uh, <laughs> I honestly think weirdly living in New York City really helped because people don't have an attention span here. Like you have to say what you need to say quickly. Um, and coming from the Midwest, that was that was a transition. That was very difficult. Um, but I think that also working because emails have to be so to the point. And like, I spent four years working in an office environment in New York City. I just feel like that got me thinking in a much faster way. Um, and then approaching my work in a different way. Now I'm almost trying to unlearn it because I only know how to write brief pieces now. Um, and then for humor, I find that watching a lot of Saturday Night Live helps and then watching Key and Peele because they kind of distill an idea into just like a little clip. And I think that that's a good model for an essay in a sense, because, you know, if it's, if it's funny, there's often something deeper that they're making a point about as well. It's not just like slapstick or something. So those definitely helped. And then of course, like reading a lot. So shouts and murmurs, reading brevity essays, reading Sweeney's as well. Well, I, I feel like, um, I mean, uh, flash writing has a lot in common with comics. It's a form, like the, the point of comics is immediacy. Like uh, the generally, like there are, you know, we could argue this all day long, but the one of the sort of foundations of comics is the idea that a single panel communicates what it is instantly. Like you shouldn't, there shouldn't be ambiguity or confusion unless that's the point of a specific scene but it's about communicating something really fast and an idea really fast. And so I think those, those things are um, very much in concert with them. And that's something that I, um, it, that's like also a struggle to learn in terms of framing in a comic and think it similarly to how it is in, in prose. Like how much are you showing if you have such a, little, a small space, uh, like kind of like how much of the room can you see? Um, and that's in a, in a, in a prose piece or in, in a, in a panel or in a comic. Uh, I love these three completely different perspectives and three completely different examples of everything that, that flash nonfiction can be. It's really inspiring. Um, so Dinti, did you want to take an audience question? Yeah, there's uh, uh, Nan, Nan G wonders what I think a lot of us are wondering right now. I don't know if, uh, 
how do we stay positive and moving forward in these difficult times? Um, and I think she means more than just writing there. I know it, I've heard a lot about how hard it is to write, um, but I'm gonna ask people to reflect however they want. How do, you, how do you keep writing or how do you just move forward in this period we're in right now? And by the way, thank you, Nan. Yeah. Well, I would like to hear some, uh, how people are doing that, because I would like to learn. Um, <laughs> but I, uh, for me, I think uh, sort of one of my mantras for this time has been uh, like community care is self-care. And I think that's been really important to me. Um, I've been uh, like my mutual, my local mutual aid group in my neighborhood has become uh, an essential space for me. Um, it's also meant it distracts me a lot from my writing and I'm away from, I'm not writing as much as I probably were in the before times. And I think that's also part of this time. That's, that's also for me, that's part of this time is, is, um, is focusing more on the community than my own personal work. And there is like a certain anxiety in that sometimes too, but I also recognize that we're in this emergency space. Um, so I also understand that that's not a, a, uh, super helpful answer. So I'm interested to hear what others have to say. Um, I, I, I mean, I do, I found writing to be also really hard to do during this period. Um, it's just, and one thing that's been, that has like, I, I think actually, I, I think when I can make myself write, those are good days and I go to sleep feeling good, you know, mm -hmm. when I'm work because I'm like oh this is you know this time is being redeemed um but one thing that that I think has is really interesting is that there's there's so many different ways to publish now things like brevity and so it used to be like if you if you wrote something and you were proud of it you you could it could be a year or two before you hear any sort of feedback whereas now you can have a sub stack you can have uh you can you can self-publish in all these different ways. And I, I think that's something that happened to me. And similarly, like the, it's the community that ended up being what saved, saved me is that actually I'm like constantly producing things in conversation with people in a way that didn't happen before because we waited to publish things. Whereas now I'll, someone will write something and then someone else will write a response to it and someone else will write a response to it. And it's all happening where people are working hard to craft their writing, but it's 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 like a, a, a cacophony or something that that actually has a ton of energy uh, in it that is a release that people need now. And I think that that for me, sort of like leaning into everybody complains about Zoom. We're on a Zoom, but for me, like leaning into what these new ways of of having community can be, and instead of lamenting them like going right at them has, has been, has been a pleasure for me. Uh, for me, I think that um, like what Kristen said about thinking about others seems to really help. So um, I'm a firstly, I'm teaching for the first time and it's virtual and everything's crazy, moved to a new area. Um, and I think that having to show up for my students and look normal and like, think about them helps a lot because they're looking to me as like some sort of person that will teach them things and then I like have to teach them things and so just going through the motions of thinking of others and like I don't know I just I feel so bad for them like this is their college experience and I, I really feel like that's that's terrible um so like with teaching that's definitely helped um and I think just of course they being grateful for things because with everything stripped away with all the time we have to reflect i think it puts things into perspective it deepens friendships because you have to think about the people you do have and it's not about accumulating things anymore it's more about looking around and thinking like wow i really appreciate this person because those are the people you're reaching out to um and that should teach you things so i mean maybe it's a period of time where people just really reevaluate re where they are um so that can be good in a lot of ways you're teaching virtually? I am. I thought I was going to be hybrid, and then they switched it like the week before classes started. What, a, what, a, what an odd experience for your first semester in a new job, but I, you, have, you have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. 
What about you, Dinty? <laughs> um, I have a hard time. I, I've stayed pretty positive. I'm, 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 I'm an optimist, and I've always, I've always, I've, I believe, I, I believed early on this was going to end very soon. I was wrong, but actually believing that helped me get through the first month or so. And then when I realized, you know, we're in for the long haul, um, I sort of just forced myself to get outside and walk a lot because we're in a small town here. And, and now I'm, I'm 100% like, we've got vaccines. I can hear the trucks. They're coming around the corner. And I know I'm being a little bit Susie Sunshine optimistic. The trucks aren't quite coming around the corner full of vaccines yet, but I latch on to that. And sometimes I let myself daydream that, that amazing moment when I'm like wandering into a restaurant and my friends are in there and we're saying, hey. So it's a combination of, of positive thinking and fantasy, I guess, mm -hmm. and long walks. Long walks help a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, Zoe, did you want to tackle that question? I think Tori was about to say something. Oh, oh no, 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 please, you go first. No, no, I have, I have a question, but I'll, I'll wait until okay. I... Well, for me, you know, some days are better than others. Um, but strangely, uh, I, I feel like I'm doing a lot more meaningful communication with people than I normally do. And I don't really know how to feel about that because obviously, you know, the pandemic is terrible and it sucks to be inside all the time. And um, I feel very unhealthy because I'm sitting all all of the time, you know, to do work inside rather than walking to work, rather than, you know, doing all these things that I usually do. But um, something that's helping me a lot is I, I text people more. I talk to people on the phone more. I uh, live in a world now where people are totally comfortable talking on Zoom, you know, which was always an awkward thing mm -hmm. before. And um, so I think that's, that's the way that I'm getting through it is reaching out and talking to friends in a more meaningful capacity than I had time to do before. Um, I, have, I have a quick question just because it, I thought about it. Um, Kristen, you said your next book is not a memoir. Mm -hmm. It's a study of loneliness in, in, in like, uh, was it like a research, that's a two part question. Was it a research type of thing where you, where you research this? And then secondly, I was thinking about the fact that like, mostly I'm writing fiction these days, but like a lot of it is thinly veiled where I'll put my friends, <laughs> yeah. you know, and like, they all know who they are. Yeah. And you describe me like this, like, how did, how dare you? And, um, you know, and it's a game finding yourself a little bit, but I was thinking like, you're actually drawing people. Like, it's hard for me to like, be like, to like accurately describe my friends in prose, but you're like, you know, and, and if you're doing research, you're drawing strangers, you yeah. know, like, how do you, how do you figure out how the, like, the approach to that? It's a, it's a really, that's a really interesting question. I think it's, um, I mean, it's a challenge, like every artist has to, has to sort of make their own rules for that. Um, I think like, in my next book, I like, I like to draw, I like to draw friends like in random scenes just because it's easier to draw someone that I know than it is to draw a stranger. And also it's just like fun. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's like harder if you're talking about someone who maybe you're not writing about so favorably. Um, and then I just, I sort of just make a decision whether I'm gonna draw that person how they are or um, cast as, as sort of someone else. Um, but, uh, and of course that's, those things are really different in fiction and nonfiction. My third book, Terrible Men, which I'm working on now is a novel, but I think um, similar to what you're describing, it has some, you know, basis in, in reality because, you know, my lived experience informs the stories that I tell. So it's a challenge, but the, um, the and it's like a, a thing that, um, I think in general, the people are like pretty excited to just like have someone draw them because it's just a cool, like, it's so cool if you see someone draw you, you know, I mean, like I, it's, it's just like such a strange thing to see yourself sort of visualize yeah. through somebody else's eye. I think with writing too, I mean, um, I think people do get upset about the way that they're rendered sometimes in any book, but I think sometimes it's not the people that we expect. And a lot of times people are just like kind of honored to be, 
you know, written about in a certain way. But yeah, the loneliness book was, uh, it's, it, it, I've been working on it for five years and then a pandemic hit in which we all uh, are more isolated than we've ever been. But uh, um, loneliness in America has been uh, on track to become an epidemic. It's um, supposed to be classified as an epidemic by 2030. Um, and loneliness is really bad. It, uh, it kills you over time, basically. You're, uh, every, every sort of high prevalence uh, killer gets you faster when you're alone, when you're lonely. Um, so we, I hope we get out of this soon. <laughs> the, the trucks full of vaccines are right around the corner. Yeah. Up here. Okay, I'm good. Uh, can you send one, send one on, on over this yeah. way too? Yeah, thank uh, you, Dindy. Yeah. So thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Rajpreet. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, thank you to the uh, people who've come and, and, and listened to us and talked to us tonight. And I think I'm going to bounce it back to Maris, who's uh, our host, and thank you, uh, McNally Jackson, for what you've done. It was such a pleasure. Um, thanks to all of you and all of you. I'm pointing to the side of the screen where people are chatting. And um, please, if you can, buy books. If you can't, tweet something nice about us. <laughs> um, and have a great night. Thank, thank you, Maris. You. Thank you, McNally Jackson. I miss you. I miss, I miss McNally so much. Thank you. <laughs>